It's really an honor to be here to give this lecture, and there's very little that I can add to the wonderful things that you've heard about Marty, except to say that it's very personal for me as well. I got to meet Marty my first week of graduate school when he was assigned as my advisor, and I went to the NBER, which seemed like a terrifying thing to do, and I got to work with Marty as a research assistant and then as a teaching assistant for ECH 1420, and eventually I got to lecture with him in ECH 1420, which was surreal real, and I remember um, throughout graduate school, Marty's amazing dedication to his students. He did so much. He was this world leader and advisor of presidents and chancellors, and I would occasionally get a phone call from Jerry Johnson. I think I saw her in the room earlier and say, Marty would like to see you because it had been a couple of weeks and I hadn't gotten that much done. <laughs> and Marty was on top of this and cared so much about his students' success and the amount of time and energy he devoted in so many of us for our whole careers. I feel so lucky to have had the opportunities that I have working at the Council of Economic Advisors, working with corporate boards, working in different universities, and I know how important Marty's support and sponsorship of me for all of those activities was. I would not have had those chances were Marty not the dedicated supporter that he is for the whole profession and for me personally. So I feel incredibly lucky to be here, to have had the experiences that I've had, and particularly honored to be able to give this lecture this year. So without further ado, uh, I want you to note that the title for the lecture, thanks to Jim, calls on, uh, oops, Yes, there we go, uh, calls on a title from one of Marty's early papers, and, and I will draw on some of Marty's work throughout this. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the economics of evidence-based health policy and how we have and haven't contributed to driving forward a better dialogue on what really works in the healthcare system and what doesn't. So I'm going to start the lecture just by talking about what I mean by evidence-based health policy and then talk about our strengths and weaknesses as a profession. Although, of course, now that I'm a dean, I don't talk about anybody as having any weaknesses. <laughs> there are just opportunities and challenges. Um, and then I, I will highlight some of the key issues in the current reform debate and try to draw out the ways that the profession has and has not been able to speak to what some of those central issues are. And we've had amazing opportunities to draw out the features of what seem like very disparate um, very disparate policies and bring analytical insights that come from the strength of our economic toolkit and to highlight the trade-offs that we face in making decisions about competing challenges in health policy. There are winners and losers of every policy option on the table and economics is a particularly adept set of tools at highlighting what those trade-offs are even though we don't always see those discussed in the policy debate in the same way. And of course, achieving impact is not just about economics, it's about economists. You can't see that down in the bottom, but it's really about economists and health policy. You know the old saying about guns don't kill people? Economics doesn't make good policy. Economists make good health policy. <laughs> So I, I'm going to start off just by fixing ideas. What do I mean by evidence-based health policy? You'd think this is uncontroversial. Everyone is in favor of evidence-based health policy, right? And we're against fraud and we're pro-puppies. But it's not, it's not as uncontroversial as it might sound because the minute economists stand up in public and say, you know, what does that actually cost, as you saw in some of those wonderful cartoons, someone inevitably says, you can't put a price on your health. Well, economists tend to be the skunk at the garden party and say, not only can you put a price on your health, you know, you in particular, we're going to put a price on your health, which is not a very popular thing to say, but you have to put a price on health because you can't make a decision about what's more important, investing in health, investing in kids' education, investing in transportation or infrastructure, if you're not willing to quantify those things and make trade-offs. And that often sounds cold-hearted, but of course, bringing evidence to bear to direct resources to where they actually produce the most public good, I would argue is a much more compassionate way to approach, approach a problem than to just take something that sounds like a good idea and pour a lot of resources into it, whether it works or not. Uh, so what do we mean by each of these terms? First of all, 
policies need to be specified. Slogans aren't policies, and we hear a lot of debate about things like a single-payer health care system or investing in population health. Now, that can be a useful rallying cry to draw out certain worldviews that people have when they say they're in favor of single-payer health or they're in favor of market-based answers. They're conveying a lot of different things. What they're not conveying is the details of a policy that you could actually analyze. And when you start to look at something like single-payer health care or Medicare for all, you realize that people who say they're in favor may mean very, very different things. When we say a single-payer system, is it the Medicare program? Is it Medicare fee-for-service? Is it uh, the Medicare Advantage plan? Is it a premium support check that you can use to buy your own private insurance? Those have very different implications for the healthcare system. And by peeling apart what people actually mean, we can then evaluate, would the policy on the table achieve that goal or not? But if you're not specific, it can mask all sorts of ills underneath. Also, it's important to distinguish, once you've specified a policy, what goal you're trying to achieve with that policy. People may be in favor of policies for very different reasons, and the evidence may be then supportive or not supportive of those different reasons. For example, uh, there's a, a movement to pay more for care coordination. You want to pay primary care doctors so that they can manage patients' health care throughout the system. Well, if your goal is to improve the coordination of care for chronic conditions to keep diabetic blood sugar under control or to reduce obesity, coordinating care seems pretty important for that, and there's some evidence to support it. But if your goal is to lower health care spending by reducing duplicated tests, by keeping people out of the hospital, there's very little evidence that paying for coordinated care achieves that goal. So if you're going to be in favor of coordinating care, it better be for a reason that's supported by the evidence, not for another reason that also sounds nice. And then the flip side of that is that the same goal can be achieved with multiple policies, and figuring out which one is most effective is really important in directing resources to where they're going to do the most good. For example, that same paying for care coordination uh, there may be other ways to reduce bad coordination of care and bad handoffs. Maybe instead of paying a primary care provider to coordinate, you want to promote electronic health records so that when patients go from site to site, whether they've had a test or not goes along with them. That might be an equally or more effective way to achieve that goal. So bringing evidence to bear requires specifying what the policy is and what you're trying to achieve through the policy. Now, uh, evidence then, how do you bring evidence to bear? Of course, economists are notoriously bad at understanding what actual human beings think. So our introspection is probably the least effective way to approach this. We have all sorts of theories that predict the effects of different policies, and those theories are incredibly useful. It gives us an analytical framework to be able to interpret often conflicting evidence, and I'm going to come back to that. But even with the best of theory, even, you know, demand slopes down, we're really, really sure of that one, it doesn't tell you the magnitude of the effects you're likely to see. And in so many policy situations, there are effects that go in opposite directions. And so you really need empirical evidence to say what the net effect on healthcare utilization or management of diabetes or any one of a number of policies is likely to be. So we know we need data. And then, of course, no one study gives us the answer to these questions. That's why we're all still in business. Thank goodness there's still plenty of work to do in health policy. So there's always a set of studies that speak to any given question. And being able to interpret that, the analytical framework is really helpful for pulling the pieces together. But the challenge that we face is interpreting the evidence through a lens of the quality of the underlying data, the generalizability of the study, not based on our prior views about which policies are best. And this is not a universally held view. In economics land, where I, I am happy to live with you all, uh, it's pejorative to call something a piece of advocacy rather than a piece of research. That's not the way every discipline views the distinction between advocacy and evidence. Uh, I like to think that keeping your own policy views out of your reading of the evidence generates a better body of evidence and makes you a more reliable reporter to research or to translate research to policymakers. I think there's a real strength 
in policymakers not necessarily knowing what your personal views are when they read your research. So when I read an article and I say, well, the author of this study is clearly in favor of policy X because of a set of preferences, that undermines, in my view, the uh, persuasiveness of the research. And I think policymakers really value uh, that as a pr profession, we have a reputation for being able to translate work in a way that separates out preferences from what the evidence actually says. Well, does that actually work? That all sounds nice. Sometimes it's true. But there's, of course, a reality of political constraints. And that's another uh, important thing in generating evidence that's actually useful, is we have all of these you know, budget constraints and other first order conditions, second order conditions. Political constraints have to enter into that calculus. And this is one of the things that uh, Marty was so adept at, was understanding what are the first order concerns that people have and how do policies actually play out in reality and letting that shape an analysis of the options that are actually on the table. Uh, and this is one of uh, Marty's more recent working papers on the topic. And because the NBER has gone all digital, I had to color it yellow because I couldn't find the little yellow jackets anymore. Um, but I colored it yellow. I'm balancing the goals of health care provision. You know, he, he was an expert at being able to pull together these different threads to say, what does it say on net? Now, as a profession, we have a number of strengths in this. As a discipline, we have a number of strengths we have a really high causal bar, and that is an incredibly valuable thing, to be able to differentiate uh, between associations and correlations and what we can really identify as the causal effect of different policies. We're really good at pulling apart other people's arguments. That healthy skepticism, I think, it is a wonderful uh, treatment for the everything that sounds like a good idea deserves support uh, impulse that I think that we all feel as humans. Now, we also have this deep understanding of markets and of incentives and how, how we pay for things drives what we end up getting. And that's going to be particularly important in the healthcare examples that I'll go through. But also of the incidence of things. The way you write down a tax rate on paper does not necessarily translate to who pays the tax rate. Uh, the price that you write down as a gross price is not necessarily the net price that people pay. And understanding the true incidence of these policies gives insight into distributional consequences that I think might otherwise go unnoticed. Now, of course, we have uh, some shortcomings as a profession as well. Uh, when advising policymakers, it's hard to put aside that academic lens that we spend all of our time on as academic researchers. There's a very different set of expectations once you translate to the policy world. Uh, it's helpful to be more decisive. Nobody wants to hear the 18 caveats that we normally expect in an academic paper. It's also helpful to be timely. If results come out years after the policy debate, we may be really sure of the answer and it may be much too late to impact legislation. Putting aside second order concerns and focusing on first order problems again goes against the grain of what makes for a successful academic paper, but is crucial for successful uh, policy influence. And then last, translational efforts. Being able to spend the time to take something that is perfectly comprehensible to somebody else with the same academic background and bring it to other disciplines or bring it to the policy world that takes time away from other things that you might be doing. And there's not a lot of reward in it, especially for junior researchers. And being able to spend the time to make something into a white paper, to write an op-ed, to spend time translating to reporters and policymakers, that means one fewer paper that you're going to write. And making that trade-off is, is something that's very hard to do and something I think about, especially now from a policy school lens, where you think the whole raison d'etre of a policy school is to have some impact on public policy. Can we be advising junior people to spend time doing that instead of just getting one more paper before it's time for tenure? I don't think we have a great answer for that. Uh, so now I want to turn to the current policy debate. Uh, I want to highlight two goals that a lot of people have when they discuss health policy reforms. Uh, their allocative goals and their productive goals in terms of driving more efficient health care delivery. Uh, allocation, access to care and coverage, in some ways that's the easy one. 
One of the main goals of health reform was to expand insurance to cover more people. We know how to do that pretty well. You can expand Medicaid, you can give subsidies for private insurance, you can have a mandate, it can come with a penalty. There are lots of trade-offs in those, but we have a much better sense of how that works to expand coverage. What we're uh, less, where there is a little less uh, reason in the discourse is the rationale for doing that. I think it would be easier if we were trying to expand insurance because it somehow benefited everyone. I'm better off if Jim is insured. Well, you could say, you know, Jim could be spreading disease, and if he's insured and he gets treated, then I'm not going to get his cooties. Uh, that does not seem like a very persuasive rationale for expanding insurance. Fundamentally, expanding insurance to people who can't afford to buy it on their own is about altruism, and it forces a real wrestling with the distributional preferences that drive that policy. Redistribution is a matter of preferences rather than something that the data can speak to. And there's a lot of discussion about whether health care is a right or not in today's debate. That's kind of the wrong question in my view, in that health care is not one thing. When we talk about a right to housing, we usually talk about a right to adequate housing. Or when you think about food stamps, it's so that people won't go hungry. If we think of health care as one thing, do you have a right to it or not, that spawns a very different debate from if you say, how much health care do we want to be sure that even low-income people have? How much redistribution do we want to do? Until you're willing to unpack that, I think you can't answer the tough questions of what public insurance should look like, how much should be subsidized, not just who should be subsidized. So I think it's helpful to sort of fix ideas about where we are in health insurance coverage. The vast majority of people in America still get their insurance through their employer. We know this is the relic of the tax code and that this is preferred relative to other forms of compensation. You get a lot of public discussion about insurance premiums on the health insurance exchanges and how well they're functioning and whether they're going to implode or not. It's worth noting, um, there it is, that that is actually a very small share of the market. That little sliver is health insurance exchanges. It's important a lot of those people were not insured otherwise, and there's a real discussion about how different forms of public insurance expansion may or may not crowd out other insurance, but uh, I think that that gets a disproportionate share of the discourse. The ACA in 2014, you can see a pretty sharp drop-off in the share of the population that was uninsured. It's, uh, I think, borne out in all sorts of analyses. It's worth noting that there is still a pretty wide spread in insurance coverage based on demographic characteristics, based on the states in which people live. Uh, there's been a, a huge gain in the number of people having insurance, but it has not been uniformly felt. That first goal, I think, is much easier to wrestle with than the second goal of improving the efficiency of healthcare delivery or the production of healthcare. There is very little disagreement that we spend a lot of money on healthcare, uh, but there's a lot there's a lot less discussion on how we can improve the value that we get out of the system. As an economist, you know there are all those questions you get on the plane, like you know. What stocks should I invest in? You know, and my answer to that is always, if I knew, I wouldn't be with you in coach. Um, and then people say, I say, no, 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 I'm not that kind of economist. I'm a health economist. And they say, so how much of GDP should we be spending on health care? And the answer is, I don't know. You know. It depends how much would be efficient to spend. And we don't live in a world where we're allocating our resources all that efficiently. We're spending pushing close to 20% of GDP on health care. Is that too much? Well, not if we were living forever. That'd be pretty good. It's easy to spend less money on health care. If you just eliminate big public programs like Medicare, you spend a lot less money on health care, but nobody would argue that that's good policy because, in fact, health insurance is really good for people's health, as I'll get to in a second, and big programs like Medicare, nobody would suggest eliminating. So rather, we should be focusing the debate on how we can actually get more health for every dollar we spend. Now, that doesn't mean the share of GDP is irrelevant. As we know, 
the amount of money that we publicly fund drives deadweight loss, and it's a real constraint for policymakers to know how much you would have to raise taxes to pay for 30 percent of GDP if half of it is coming through public programs. So it's really important to understand how we finance this. Where does the money come from? Where does it go? Uh, this is sources of spending for health insurance, for health care. Most of our dollars are coming from private insurance. Here, too, it's worth noting that that bottom layer there is out-of-pocket spending. There's been a lot of discussion about the rising share of spending that's coming out of pocket. It looks kind of pancake flat, though. So what is happening with that? Well, that flat level, I think, masks two different things that are going on. We are getting a lot more people covered by Medicaid, which has very low cost sharing at the same time that employer plans are introducing more cost sharing. So there is a change in the composition there, but the debate is probably still disproportionate. If you look at the public attention focused on out-of-pocket spending versus what's going on with our public programs, it's a remarkably stable share. In terms of where the money goes, again, it's very interesting to contrast the pattern with where we actually see the public discourse. Uh, that my little arrows aren't working very well. The next to top slice is prescription drug spending, where again, you can see the share doesn't look like it's growing all that fast. It's growing faster than other shares, and there are lots of good reasons to focus the debate on prescription drug spending, but it's uh, worth noting that list prices look very different from net prices, and the profession is working hard to accumulate the additional data that uh, would help us tease that apart, but the bulk of our healthcare dollars are going to hospitals and physicians, and there's just not a lot of attention being paid to how we can rein those in or how much value we're getting out of those as well. Now, we spend a lot more than other countries. This is uh, dollars per capita. The graph looks almost the same if you look at share of GDP or even if you adjust for income differences across countries. So why do we spend so much more than those other countries? This is a, another great example of where the analytical framework of economics has actually helped to inform the discourse. First thing that you want to do when you think about total spending is decompose it into prices and quantities. We know that spending is price times quantity, and uh, there's a, a wide literature coming from lots of different disciplines looking at how much is prices and how much is quantities. And you would think this would be a pretty easy decomposition to do, but it's not because quality is very hard to measure. And if you can't measure quality, you can't measure quantity. And if you can't measure quantity and you're saying, well, let's see which part is price and which part is quantity, your decomposition is, is already uh, problematic. It's really hard to measure quality because a night in the hospital means something very different in a more intensive setting versus a less intensive setting. Even if you could measure quality, though, suppose we had great measures of prices and quantities. And the answer, you know, despite uh, Uwe Reinhardt's very memorable paper, it's the price is stupid, I still think it's kind of some of each, which probably means I'm really stupid. But I, I think it's some of each, even though the quantities are, are hard to measure. But that doesn't tell me what policy I want to implement. You can't really have a policy that says there shall be lower prices without having a profound effect on quantity. And it's interesting to look at public sur surveys of the public, public opinion polls, where they ask people, you know, what's wrong with the healthcare system? And people say, I want prices to be lower. Well, yes, if you could get all the same stuff, but pay half as much, I vote for that too. It's just that's not in our choice set, <laughs> because when you change the prices, the quantities are likely to change as well. And understanding the underlying source of variation in price or quantity, is it because of differences in the competitive landscape on the provider side? Is it because of differences in insurance coverage on the patient side? Understanding those fundamentals is crucial to then being able to make good policy about how you might want to change the marketplace in which these things are happening or the subsidies for different activities that would result in changes in prices or changes in quantities. All of that is about how much we spend on health care, but I started off by saying we should care a lot about value, not just you know, how much we're spending. And again, it's really hard to measure the health that each of those dollars produces. I spent uh, several years in my career at Dartmouth, so I'm contractually obligated to put up maps everywhere I go. So, so this first map is showing us uh, how much Medicare spends for fee-for-service enrollees. They have the same Medicare uh, benefit. 
in different parts of the country, you can see that it varies by a factor of two. And this is adjusting for age, sex, race, uh, price levels. There's just huge variation in how much the same insurance program spends. And on the right, you see how, much, uh, how often Medicare beneficiaries are discharged from the hospital for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So you can think of these as bad discharges where people shouldn't have been in the hospital in the first place. If they'd gotten better primary care, they wouldn't have had to be hospitalized. So think of that as a marker of inadequate primary care provision. And if you look at that, you can kind of squint and do the re regression in your heads. Yeah, that's what year three of grad school is all about. And you can see that uh, those are correlated such that the parts of the country where we spend the most are the parts of the country where Medicare beneficiaries are the least likely to get that adequate primary care. Now, we are probably not spending money for the purpose of avoiding giving diabetic patients eye exams. Something else is going on. This correlation isn't telling us the underlying problem, nor does it tell us what the policy should be. It's tempting to say geographic variation is bad. We should stamp that out. But of course, leveling down versus leveling up looks very different, and the answer shouldn't be a policy targeting geographic variation, although that's kind of exactly what we got out of these maps. Um, but the answer is probably understanding the underlying causes of the geographic variation and the likely inefficiency that they signal. Now, we're also seeing wide variation in private spending as well, and there's new data that uh, economists have pulled together to be able to uh, assess the degree to which private payers have huge variation in spending across areas. And I, I should have said at the beginning, I am criminally undersighting because everybody in this room has generated all of this literature, and I realized I just didn't have the time to call out all of the papers. So you should all consider yourselves really well cited in all of this. Um, <laughs> each one of you produced all of these papers. Uh, and so, so really, it, it points to the importance of how we pay for healthcare as a key driver. I'm going to talk briefly about the patient side levers, the provider side levers, and the competitive marketplace in which they do or don't interact as avenues for trying to drive towards higher value spending, and then I'm going to try to wind down. Uh, again, this was the earliest NBER paper that I could find of Marty's, and, and it's the effect of national health insurance on price and quantity. Uh, so, so Marty, early on, was one of the promoters of thinking about how we pay for value instead of paying for quantity of care. So, in terms of expansion, I showed you that the ACA expanded the number of insured people pretty substantially in 2014. Now, most of that came from uh, Medicaid expansions rather than from some of the other avenues like the exchanges or through the coverage of dependents or the expanded coverage of dependents, although those were important as well. We have a, an experiment going on now in understanding how powerful a mandate is with and without a penalty because you know, there, there's a, the underlying economics would suggest that a mandate that has no penalty doesn't do anything. Uh, behavioral economics says people actually pay attention to those mandates and in fact not only the people who are mandated, but other people who hear about it come out of the woodwork as well. So, so there's something to that, and I'll come back to that in a sec. These different mechanisms, Medicaid, private insurance, they look different as insurance products. They have different types of coverage, and they have different implications for whether healthy people are likely to be insured in the pool, sick people are likely to be insured, how much risk pooling there is. All of that plays out very differently based on the subsidies and the underlying pricing of the insurance. And like most things, the effects of expanding coverage are theoretically ambiguous. That, that is my actual mug from my first internship at the Congressional Budget Office. I was so excited to get that mug, and that is the only form of payment that I received for, for my hours of most excellent alphabetizing. <laughs> super, super diligent. Um, but, but of course, expanding insurance can have lots of different effects. Costs and benefits, you know, the nice uh, buckets that we put things in. The main cost of expanding insurance or subsidizing that expansion is increased health care use. Now, most non economists don't think of increased health care use as a cost, they think of that as the point of expanding insurance. You know, that, that's why we have these programs in the first place. But of course, nobody actually wants health care. People want 
health and health care, the resources you expend to get that health, if we could get the health for fewer health care dollars, that would be a good thing. Now, I just, you know, spent a little time saying how demand slopes down and being really proud of myself. So you would think this seems really obvious that when you expand insurance, you took something that was expensive and you made it free, and therefore you should see more health care use. On the other hand, people make the argument that the uninsured use health care really inefficiently, and that if you expand insurance, you can get people out of the emergency department into primary care. They'll be so much healthier they can go back to work and pay taxes, and it all pays for itself. So th there are arguments that people make that are not um, atheoretical, that expanding insurance could actually reduce health care spending in the long run. Now, on the benefit side, there are two main benefits, one of which is really underappreciated in the reform debate, and that's insurance is supposed to protect you against financial risk. Having a uh, Health insurance policy should not only get you access to health care, but should keep you from getting evicted from your apartment because you couldn't pay your rent, because you had a hospital bill. And, and this is one of the frustrations of listening to the current reform debate, is people say things like, you know, my health insurance plan was useless, I didn't even use it at all. And you think, like, I don't say my homeowner's insurance was useless because my house didn't burn down. Like, I'm just glad my house didn't burn down. But with health insurance, people don't see the insurance protection value of it up front. And similarly, you know, insurance is about risk pooling. And people say, well, the people who need health insurance the most are the sick and uninsured it's a little too late to get insurance once you are sick and uninsured. You don't need health insurance, you need health care. And that's a very different thing. So, so understanding the insurance value of insurance ought to inform the debate about the value of expanding Medicaid or what Medicare looks like. But then of course the real punchline is what happens to people's health and does it actually change health outcomes. Now, again, for each of these, there are reasons, uh, theoretical reasons that could go in either direction in terms, especially with Medicaid, where you might think that the uninsured have very little opportunity to consume health care. They're just not getting a lot of health care. And in fact, once you have Medicaid, maybe you have more access. Maybe you can incur more debt once you have access to providers. So for each of these, you actually need to see the data to know what happens. And there are a lot of different strategies for answering these questions questions. I, I gave myself one Oregon slide, which seems fair, right? <laughs> I put a lot on it, but it's just one Oregon slide. Um, to think about the effects of expanding insurance on these costs and benefits. And what we found in the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, where we had this opportunity to take advantage of a lottery in Oregon to allocate a limited number of available spots in Medicaid, uh, the, the, we think of these randomized controlled trials as the gold standard. Amy told me a story of telling Marty this, we have this new gold standard approach. Marty saying, the gold standard's bad, right? <laughs> fair point, fair point. <laughs> this really good way of isolating the causal effect of expanding insurance. Uh, and what we found was, you know, in some ways, I think, consistent with what people expected and in some ways less consistent. The consistent part is that Medicaid did, in fact, expand people's health care use. They were more likely to go to the doctor. They used more prescription drugs. They got more preventive care. But they also went to the emergency department more. And I think that this was surprising to a lot of uh, public policy analysts who were really hanging their hat on Medicaid reducing emergency department use, getting the uninsured out of the ED and into the doctor's office. Now, to put it back into our usual economics framework, what you're implicitly saying when you think that expanding Medicaid is going to reduce emergency department use is that cross-price elasticities are bigger than own price elasticities, by which I mean you took something that was expensive, the emergency department, you made it free, that should make people want to go more, but then people on the other side say, wait, you also took the doctor's office and made it free. That makes people go to the doctor's office more. If these are really strong substitutes, then the net effect could be a reduction in emergency department use. We find no evidence that having Medicaid makes them more substitutable. And in fact, we find that the increase in emergency department use persists for at least the first two, two and a half years in which people have this new insurance plan, this new insurance plan. So it looks like making the emergency department free was the dominant effect there. Uh, but this goes along with people being much more financially secure. 
Just because you could go to the emergency department when you were uninsured didn't mean you didn't get a giant bill at the end of it. And in fact, when people got Medicaid, they were 25% less likely to have a bill sent to collection, which is a really bad outcome for people. When you have a bill sent to collection, you not only have you know, a black mark on your credit report for getting a mortgage, but for renting an apartment or getting a job. This is a really bad outcome for people that was averted by having Medicaid. But then the punchline on health, what actually happened to people's health outcomes when they got Medicaid? Well, there's a bit of a mixed bag there. Their rates of depression dropped substantially which is a major health improvement for a population where depression was a substantial unmet health need. But we didn't see any detectable improvements in blood pressure, in cholesterol, in diabetic blood sugar control. It looks like those are much harder to manage and that a Medicaid policy alone is not sufficient for bringing those uh, back to normal levels. So I'm going to come back to what all of that means for health policy, but spend a minute on what we think cost sharing does for patient outcomes and what it does for patient health care utilization. Now, again, theory tells us some very strong things about what copayments should look like in a health insurance plan. It should balance the insurance value of having protection against financial risk with the moral hazard that comes along with using more health care services when they are free, as we saw. And even the term moral hazard, I think, means something very different uh, in English <laughs> than it does in economics. And, and that, that's uh, challenging to convey. But we have some strong ideas about how copayments should be structured to balance those competing effects. Medicare has surprisingly lousy financial protection on its own. A basic Medicare plan, parts A and B, leaves people exposed to almost unlimited financial risk, which is why most people have a Medigap plan or a wraparound plan that keeps them from being exposed to any financial risk, and that limits policy options on the table. And of course, there are also well-known distortions on the employer side, where because employer-sponsored health insurance is favored in the tax code, people have first dollar coverage with very little cost sharing, although that's starting to change, that drives excess utilization. That suggests the um, importance of removing that employer-sponsored insurance preference. And this is my, uh, another example of where Economists agree on something, but it takes a little bit to translate it into policy. This is one of the few examples where economists on the left and the right all agree the current system makes no sense. We favor employer-sponsored insurance with low co-payments relative to all the other things that people might want in forms of compensation. This is inefficient because it drives excess utilization, but it's also really regressive because it favors people with the most ingenerous plans, the highest incomes, and the highest income tax brackets. So there, there are very few options where you can both improve efficiency and improve distribution with one policy. So economists all say, you've got to fix that. But that just sounds wrong when you stand up and say to people, the solution to your excess health care costs is taxing your health insurance benefits, it's going to make everything better. <laughs> that just does not sound right. <laughs> and in fact, it went over like a lead balloon until somebody had the genius idea to say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not taxing the holders of expensive benefits. We're taxing the insurers who issue them. And people thought, that is right. I hate my insurer. <laughs> and so uh, thus the Cadillac tax was born not really uh, having the durability that one might expect. <laughs> you know, the, the, it's back in the debate again, saying, is this actually going to come into effect in the next few years as it was supposed to? There's a lot of distributional politics that goes on in that, running into, you know, headlong into policy versus politics again. So I am going to uh, just say a sentence about the behavioral uh, approach to this. I've talked about how we might optimally structure cost sharing in the traditional economics model. There is mounting evidence that that does not adequately capture how people behave. We see overuse of health care. We see underuse of health care. Overuse sounds consistent with moral hazard. It's hard to explain underuse of things that have enormous health benefit. We see $5 copays dissuading people from using things like anti-organ rejection medications when people have had transplants or you know, medicines that avert heart attacks and have very uh, limited side effects. If $5 is dissuading you from using those, something in our traditional rational agent model 
model is not capturing people's behavior all that well. So that suggests an alternate raft of policies, not just high deductible health plans or uh, alternative payment models, but also potentially uh, value-based insurance design, safe harbors for certain kinds of care. These are all fundamentally motivated by paternalism, but match what we see in actual behavior much more closely than the usual models. Providers are price sensitive too. Uh, we see overuse of things like antibiotics for ear infections. On the patient side, we also see providers being very sensitive to the reimbursement that they get for different procedures and acting like human beings as well, where providers are much more likely to provide antibiotics for ear infections where they are not warranted at the end of a long shift than at the beginning. They get fatigue with just saying no, 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 no to patients. And so if we could line up patient incentives and provider incentives, we could probably promote more efficient use of healthcare both by stemming overuse and underuse. I'm going to zip ahead a little bit. Uh, economists have also, uh, you heard about uh, Marty's forays into new fields and setting up whole new endeavors of applying the economic toolkit to new policy areas. Economists are starting to pay a lot more attention to healthcare delivery, working with physicians and other clinicians to try to think about how we can inject the right incentives into that resource allocation. And we're using a lot more randomized controlled trials in clinical settings, which is a wonderful opportunity, but opens up the need to communicate those results in a different way. So I want to end with the thought, does all the evidence that we're accumulating on the patient side, on the provider side, actually change the debate? So these are all headlines from newspapers uh, the day after one particular Oregon paper came out. And this was the paper that had that mixed bag of findings on the clinical outcomes. Some of the headlines are saying that Medicaid works. Some are saying Medicaid is terrible. My favorite one is that one right there, how to use the Oregon Medicaid study to your ideological advantage. It's like, wow, I'm glad somebody actually said it out loud because it's kind of frustrating. You know, looking at Amy, we spent years of our lives and millions of other people's dollars to try to generate all of this evidence. And then this is what you get? You might think, well, wait a minute, what is it all for? On the other hand, though, these are some headlines from long before the study, just examples of things that people were saying that were unduly optimistic and things that were unduly pessimistic about the value of Medicaid. If you naively look at the mortality rate of people who are on Medicaid versus the uninsured, people on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate. Is this because Medicaid is killing them? Probably not. You get on Medicaid by being poor, and being poor is bad for your health. So that seems like an unduly pessimistic thing to say, that people who are on Medicaid are worse off than if they were uninsured. Um, my little animations aren't working very well. Uh, so, so we can eliminate that unduly pessimistic view. People who are on Medicaid are substantially better off than if they were uninsured. They have better access to care, better self-reported health, lower rates of depression, more financial security. They say their health is much better. But we can also eliminate the unduly optimistic view of the program, which is it's so wonderful that it's going to get people out of the emergency department and back to work, and we're actually all going to save money. No. When you expand public insurance, you don't save money. People use more care, and that costs money. And you have to find a way to finance that, which is going to pit interests against each other. And I return then to the strengths of the approach that we bring to these thorny trade-offs. The people who are better off, Medicaid enrollees, are different from the people who are paying for the program, taxpayers. Not exclusively, but for the most part, these are the interests of two different groups, and you have to weigh them against each other. And that requires an analytical framework. Now, this... Uh, I think we've had more success than one might feel from just looking at the latest tweets. If you look, there, there's in fact a new law uh, focused on foundations for evidence-based policymaking that came out of a commission that you know economists played a key role in. You hear lots of congressional testimony. You see people cited in Supreme Court cases, and of course, I, I'm speaking about 
our profession because we're all here. This is clearly not unique to economics and it's a broader statement about evidence-based decision making. There is some hope, uh, but oxygen is scarce for this kind of debate. And I cut, that brings me back uh, to end on the amazing, <laughs> the amazing role model that Marty really was for all of us. It, it's an aspirational ideal to be able to educate students, to be able to educate policymakers, to be able to move back and forth between cutting edge academic scholarship, policy advice, and dissemination through broad media sources. Uh, Marty really embodied that rare combination of abilities that I know I strive for a little bit every day, and I suspect most of the people in the room do as well. And some days are good days, some days are less good days, uh, but because of Marty and the Bureau, we all have the resources and the network to be able to strive towards that very worthy ambition. So I will stop there and take a handful of questions until Jim says it's time for everybody to get dinner. <laughs>